Hello there. Am I on? Are we on? Live? We awesome. Are live. Hello. Welcome. The uh, welcome to the uh, Naoto's Nerdy Power Hour. Now I can tell to say that like everyone was. It took me quite a while to remember and actually <laughs> made me say this. Welcome to Naoto's Nerdy Power Hour. Uh, happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Naoto. I am the kind of head sharpener. Um, you know what? We have so many like good sharpeners in our company, but I get to do a lot more experimental stuff, I guess, here in the studio. So, um, um, you know, I wouldn't say I'm the best, best sharpener, but the, I do get to do a lot of uh, playing around. So, it's me, Naoto. And behind the camera, we have Nathan, who is looking Hello. at... Hello. Happy Friday, everybody. Who's looking at all the comments that you may uh, makes? Um, yeah. So um, hopefully the um, hopefully you, if you have any comments, um, everything, um, just put that in the comments, and we're definitely happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah. Today we are focusing on sharpening a Guto, mm. um, but we will field any you know, especially the shows about super nerd mm. knife sharpening stuff. But if you have beginner knife sharpening questions or just knife cooking questions yeah. in general, uh, we we both have lots of opinions on those things. Yes. We're happy to help. Yes, and you may you may find the uh, hey what's 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 that about you know sharpening gyuto? I'll explain it later on. A um, couple announcements before we actually get into the um, you know real action. What's an announcement? Well, we uh, we're getting a restock of Moritaka Ishime kitchen knives. Hey. I just found that out. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll be on the website in a couple mm -hmm. hours before the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but the big one, sort of, is that we're opening in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you tune into these shows regularly, you have heard us say that before. Mm -hmm. We are still finalizing the address and the opening date, date, but we are getting closer, I swear, and we'll have news real soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you are in Toronto and you're looking for a job, you want to work with knives and you love people and maybe you want to learn how to sharpen knives, mm -hmm. we are hiring. There's a hiring link in our community tab mm -hmm. on our website. Um, yeah, we're excited, very excited about the, uh, the Toronto. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's been a while. We, we, yeah. we thought we, we wanted to open one uh, in 2020. 2020. People have been asking for years. Yeah, and yeah, we, we were, we were going to go for 2020, and a uh, thing called pandemic happened. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we had to delay it for now three years now, right? But the, uh, hopefully it will uh, we'll come in up really, really, really soon. So Yeah, we're pretty excited. We're looking at uh, hopefully June to, for yeah. opening date, yeah. um, but definitely late spring, early summer of this year, mm. um, which is the closest we've ever been to opening our Toronto store. <laughs> Yes. Uh, also, we haven't even announced it online yet, but those of you who uh, are, have been with us for a while will also know that we, uh, the Knifeware Spring Garage sale is coming up soon. Mm -hmm. uh, Owen and Kevin just got back from Japan last week. Mm -hmm. They went to visit, they hung out at Fujiwara-san's 150th anniversary mm -hmm. um, of his, not, not him, he's not quite that old, <laughs> but uh, his, of his workshop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they went to Takafu, mm -hmm. they went, saw the more Takas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, the other folks, Nakagawa-san. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we've they, got to go ahead, Nato. Yeah, um, they brought back quite a, quite a few uh, good stuff. Yeah, they got yeah. some. They, they got some pretty cool and wild stuff this yeah. time. And uh, yeah, we've got, actually got a video coming out in uh, just over a week, but mm. a week and a half. Kevin just reminiscing and talking about his trip and, mm. and all the cool stuff they did with lots of cool video yeah. of that that we took. Um, but uh, but yeah, that sale will be the garage sale will be May fifteenth to twenty second. Mm. All sorts of new, one mm. of a kind, unusual stuff, uh, just things we don't usually carry. So as stay well tuned. as we do actually have quite good uh, sales section. Yeah, a bunch of discounted stock, yeah, right? Yeah, a bunch of discounted stock. Um, there will be a page that's uh, specially set up for the discounted section. So um, you know, for those of you who's looking for a little bit more, like you know, deals and such, it, it's such tough economic times, and you know, very very um, unpredictable uh, time time right now. So, you know, we'll, we'll have a good, actually, chunk uh, of section that's actually for discounted. Yeah, especially, like I mean, if you're maybe new to knifeware and you're looking to get a really good Japanese knife, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, times are tight, tough, money's tight, mm -hmm. um, there will be lots of stuff that will be really reasonably priced. We even have, and actually one of the knives Nato's working on today, we have a bunch of refurbished stock too, uh, mm. stuff that's um, for various reasons that maybe has been lightly used, mm. uh, in some cases more heavily used, but will be restored and refurbished yep. uh, at a discount. Yeah. So, 
that's that's that, that's exciting. We we'll have a lot of videos, lot like pre uh, prelude to the garage sale. We we'll have lots of videos, live streams. Um, you know, we have the uh, what you call it, the preview uh, and stuff like that. So you know, stay tuned if you are interested in those kind of stuff. But today we are going to talk about how to sharpen Gyoto. Um, it's very weird when 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 you come think about it. You know, like sharpen the uh, Certain shape knives slightly different from the others could be a little bit more advanced, right? Because the you know like you change the the way that you sharpen from knife to knife is a little bit weird. But it makes sense though. The um, when it comes to like you know cleavers and such, like it, it totally makes sense because cleavers um, to cut through the bones or to cut through the joints, you do not want to get really really keen edge on because it's it's really too you know, break into the, uh, those, you know, it's not really slicing them through, but instead you're cutting into it. So um, you need a little bit more tougher edge, where something like a little bit more um, knives, like say uh, Yanagiba, that the uh, I would usually put really, really keen edge on because that will never touch, um, that will never touch any type of bones. Uh, you slice them into very, very soft flesh, like a tuna or, the, you know, raw fish and such. Right, so I would put the very, very keen edge so that it sinks in a little bit nicer. So, when it comes to gyuto, so for those of you who is pretty new, who are not pretty really familiar with the uh, terminology, the gyuto, uh, gyuto in Japanese it, it writes the cow and sword. It is a. It was derived from actually um, European style chef's knives. This knife here, am I looking here or here? Yeah, just, uh, just the front camera for now. Oh, front camera here. So this is very typical shape of Gyuto. Gyuto comes in a lot of different length. This is, I think, really versatile, a size of 210 millimeters. I usually use 210 for a lot of stuff. For those who want to have a little bit longer blades, that's great, 240, 270, even 300, 360 millimeters are available. Um, but the uh, 210 millimeters comes really, really handy. But Gyuto, as the name suggests, it's cow sword. Japanese people uh, back in the uh, you know, samurai era, right? Back in 300, 400 years ago. Um, so like 300 years ago, yeah. The Japanese people were, we didn't eat cow. We didn't eat beef. Um, so when the Western, when we opened up the door to the, those uh, Western influences or more, more to the uh, foreign influences, they brought the, the culture of eating beef and the knife kind of came along with it. So the Japanese knife makers, blacksmiths, those people quickly adapted to create the, the shape and they call it Gyuto. Um, so, so has the Gyuto been around for that long then? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's, it's only been, it's like think about it, it's only like 150 years sure. or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, uh, it's modernization, so 1867 is the same year as the uh, Canada became oh, yeah, a no country. Kidding. Um, Dominion of Canada, you know, started 1867. Mm -hmm. That's when the major restoration happened. But, you know, the, uh, so that's kind of how it started. It. Then, it, so what I'm trying to say is Gyuto is such multifunctional, um, does pretty much everything uh, a knife. It's, it's a workhorse. It's a knife that you will grab, the first knife that you will grab when you're gonna do anything. This is my go-to shape. Um, so for some people, it may be a little bit too long, but this is my go-to uh, knife uh, size and shape. It has enough length to go through pretty much anything with a slicing action, and also it has enough height. So that when you're cutting like this way, you're not bumping your knuckles on the cutting board. As a person with big hands I really appreciate that mm -hmm. that that was a style of knife I learned to use too mm -hmm. uh, when I first started cooking and uh, yeah having that extra height is really nice yeah and it's got enough carve to it as well so that you can do, do a little bit more rock chopping too right so this is going to be your ultimate I guess multi-purpose knife and when it comes to I guess sharpen a gyuto specifically I would make, like to make this a, I guess, as multifunctional as possible, right? So you'd be able to cut something like, well, anything like veggies, tomatoes, carrots, um, so as 
to cut it into the, um, say for example, something like, um, you know, a little bit of deboning maybe, right? Like you do, you don't cut into it, right? You go around them. Yeah, you'll see a lot of chefs, like I learned to fillet a salmon with a chef's knife, yeah. a tennis chef's knife, yeah. uh, or carve a turkey, or pretty much do everything, mm -hmm. short of maybe like in the hand work, like trimming up the eyes of a potato. Absolutely, or, right? Yeah, or strawberry. Use the heel or the tip. Oh, well, yeah, Whatever, especially right? if you have a Japanese mm -hmm. gyuto compared to the German chef's knife mm -hmm. with the bolster, you can use that heel for that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you can pretty much do everything with a gyuto. So, yeah, it needs to be pretty multi-purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right? So, so first of all, I'm going to sharpen this Tarefusa Hochokobo uh, with the uh, basic, just the edge sharpening first. That's the, the, this knife. This is a great example of the knife that the I will just going to sharpen so that the, uh, for those of you who has a knife, a gyuto, and wants to just sharpen the edge with, this is going to be a great demonstration for you guys. So yeah, so today we're kind of going to go beginner, intermediate, expert. Absolutely. We're going to start with just sharpening the very edge. If this is your first time sharpening your knife, mm -hmm. we're going to get into some thinning of the knife and talk about what that even means. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of midway through, and then at the end of the show, Nato will talk about some like super crazy nerdy stuff, top secret CIA project that he's working yep. on. Um, we got lots of folks tuning in. Mm -hmm. uh, our buddy Grant Hendrick uh, says, Happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday, folks. Uh, our buddy Powell Al says, Hello mm -hmm. from Poland. Uh, so, welcome to the show. Yep. Michael uh, saw you in Superstore last night. So, he says, Hello. Hello. Oh, hey. <laughs> I guess he didn't say I, hi I, in Superstore. I, yeah, I think so. yeah, it was, it was yeah. a little. Awkward. I, I heard, I, I think I heard him say knife wear. I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, don't, <laughs> I was wearing masks and I'm like, oh, that's yeah. <laughs> say yeah. hello, yes. Yeah, well, hello, Michael. Yeah. Uh, from both of us. And we got some great questions so far. Mm -hmm. We will get to your questions a little bit later, but mm -hmm. keep the questions coming because mm -hmm. that's really what makes the show great. So, and it uh, really yeah. depends. Like, this is just my opinion, like how I like to use the gyuto, but. I will explain the reasoning behind the way and why I do the way that I sharpen. So you can apply to whatever you're sharpening it to or whatever you're cutting to, right? And, and it, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Gyuto is also like a workhorse. Like mm. it takes the majority of the work. Mm -hmm. So are we going to focus at all today on making an edge that's a little more resilient and can, can be used for longer without dulling as quickly? Absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. Absolutely. What I found, well, say, like from the long experience that they have been sharpening knives and stuff, I noticed that the, um, I made my knife quite um, nice. Oh, I mean, like I do sharpen them. But the, oftentimes I found when you sharpen a few knives and, you know, get to the really the point that you, you, it cuts through the papers and stuff like really nice and you go home and you test it on the, um, you know, food, you know, it cuts really like, nice. But I found in, oftentimes when you finish, especially when you're cutting on the cutting board, the finer you finish your edge with, it actually feels like it loses it a little bit faster. So, and there are some like sharpeners does it this way already, but for just the edge sharpening today, I'm actually going to start and finish on one stone. Da, da, da. <laughs> I don't know if that is. I need a, a soundboard for yeah, that. Okay. My, my voice sound right. effects are very good. Okay, so we're only using one stone for this first. For sharpening. this first sharpening. Right. Um, I'm going to use this a uh, Naniwa uh, 400 diamond stone. It is not the uh, those diamond plate like a uh, like these guys here. It's it's the diamond uh, abrasion or already kind of mixed in to this uh, this plate right here. Uh, the surface is has only a one millimeter thickness, but because it has a quite a bit of abrasion, it cuts the steel really, really nice and fast. A few things that I would mention though, the way I cut, I use the tip to do scoring, right? Like when you're the, uh, when you're gonna uh, dice the onions, you know, mm -hmm. I do this, mm -hmm. do this, I do that. You know, use the tip for that purpose. Yeah. Heel, that's where it, all the force is going to be, I guess, like, blunt force is going to be applied. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where, where the uh, hits the hardest, I guess, right? So what I'm going to do, I've probably done it a few times, but the, uh, for this 
for that purpose, I'm going to make the uh, heel of the knife really strong and the tip of the knife a little bit thin. This is not a signature move, but it yes. for a good reason. Because <laughs> it, it works really well. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is the set the uh, probably a heel at, say I'm just going to stir from the heel. You could stir from both either way. I stir from the heel about, like say, 20 degrees. And how it's going to happen is as I go to the tip, usually, usually, I raise knife like this. This is to keep the same angle. Right? But instead, I'm going to actually lower. And so you're not going to set like one angle in the back half and another angle in the front half. It's more like a, a gradual transition you to some could, extent. Like if you are the uh, beginner or you're learning, you can do this first. Yeah. Change the angle. Then change the angle. You can definitely do that. The um, that's the, you know like your comfort level, right? If you're comfortable doing the way I do, do it. But the uh, I guess like for beginners. If you're not comfortable, uh, you can definitely do stir from the heel, do this, and the middle, lower, and tip, even lower. And, and what sort of angle are you aiming for on the other side of the spectrum on the tip of the knife? Mm. 15, So I degrees? usually stir from like about 20, like the western style, and maybe in the middle, and probably 10, 15. It, it looks 10, like 15. about 10 degrees, yeah, like from where pretty, I'm sitting yeah, on the other side of the stove. Pretty low, I think. And Powell L says, in the style of Masashi Yamamoto? Mm hmm. Pretty much. Pretty much. So, you could do it this way too, like very low and start to high up. It is quite common um, sharpening skill that a lot of people do. So, basically, where your two fingers, where your three fingers, whatever, uh, how many fingers you're putting, this is where, you, where you're pressuring, that's where you're uh, sharpening. So here, lower, lower, right? And you do that until you raise the burr. Here's also, when you're sharpening the back of the knife, this also comes a little bit more like a multifunctional knife sharpening. So, the way I sharpen, this is very typical, right? This. Because I'm going to sharp, start and finish on this 400 grit, the grain of the, um, I guess, direction of the grain actually comes more, uh, matters more. Right, because the whatever direction the teeth are facing in, mm -hmm. like the little microscopic teeth you're making, mm -hmm. that's going to, like if you pull it versus push it, mm -hmm. it's going to cut very differently. It's exactly, right? Okay. So right now, the way in which that the, the edge direction goes this way, because I'm moving, right? So mm -hmm. hey, teeth are lining up this way right now. And what this edge is good at is really the pull cut. Like it, it's almost like you know. Because those teeth are gonna bite into like the skin yeah, it's of the like a, yeah, it's like yeah, it's like a bunch of needles, right? Right. Like a bunch of needles facing this way, right? Right. Now. I've noticed that before, where I have a knife that's like maybe kind of losing its edge a bit, mm -hmm. and I can if I pull it one way, it cuts well, and if I push it, it doesn't cut so mm -hmm. well, or vice versa. So what I'm going to do is. Right now, when I'm sharpening the first side with this edge facing this way, so I'm going to create another back side. I'm going to create the edge goes this way. It's it's also massage sans in advice. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, it's the. Yeah. Um, it's I mean, the the guy's pretty smart. He yeah. thinks a lot about this stuff. Cross, as do you. Cross angle, right? Yeah, so, cross edge. So, I'm gonna keep my knife. I guess perpendicular to the stone, all the way, yeah. right? Then, so I start from the heel. Let's yeah, so you're the pointing the knife tip in the same direction, yeah. but you just flip the knife over. So I, I just want to make the edge this way. And lower, then lower. 
it's awkward, but like this. Make sense, I think? Makes sense to me. I, I'm going to have to try this. <laughs> Havanas has a has a has a good point, <laughs> a fair point, saying different angles on the same edge is not for beginners. We mm -hmm. did say this was the beginner. Oh, portion. sorry. <laughs> I, so this is Nauto's nerdy power hour, <laughs> and uh, sometimes we fail to explain that we get a little more in depth here. So it's it's beginner advanced. <laughs> like if you already know about yeah. knife sharpening, then it's beginner. Um, if you never should sharpen a knife right. in your life. You should probably go watch my beginner knife sharpening video right. that I put out right. earlier this right. year. Because um, right. that one's a lot more beer friendly. Right. right. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to <laughs> miss. Needed the a uh, little more uh, clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Beginner yeah. for advanced yeah. sharpeners. Yeah. So that's how I create the heel. Again, it's the same thing. High. Middle low, but still wants to do this motion and lower at the heel. And you're not really pushing on the edge there. You're just kind of guiding the knife forward with your... Because you had your fingers up near the spine there when you got towards the tip. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to push too that much because this stone has like enough abrasion. It's, it, it cuts really, really fast. This knife itself was actually pretty sharp to begin with so as well. I'm actually creating that little bit different edge. I think it's good to mention too that like uh, if, you're, if you're sharpening a knife that's already still kind of sharp compared to a knife that's like mm -hmm. a hammer, yeah. you can start on pretty different stones. Yeah. So that was pretty you know, straightforward. I got the burr all the way. I'm going to break this burr off by... So same thing, the same direction, I'm going to keep that the uh, directional thing, but, and also the very similar angle, but I don't know if you noticed a little bit different um, way of deburring from the other, maybe some other people. I'm actually deburring edge facing. We get, we get a lot of questions about this kind of thing, so why is that? Well, this is also the, uh, you know, the te technique that I learned from Masai San. And what he said is that, especially when you're finishing your edge with the um, coarse stone, like 400, and also the, some of the, the little bit more, hmm? 400 or like say 1,000 even, um, this, this way, it breaks off the edge quite easier as well because they don't want to flip it back and forth. As well, it could create what he calls a double edge. And this double edge, despite the popular belief of the edge, that ne edge needs to be apex, like a an apex, which means basically just one peak. He, what he was saying is that the by very um, lightly, you don't put a lot of pressure, very lightly deburring it this way, it can create, if all things goes, you know, well, <laughs> <laughs> it can create this, he calls it double edge. So it's, it, it goes like this, but the apex breaks it off and creates very tiny, mm. two peaks. That creates more bite and it also a directional works better and also keeps the edge longer. That's freaking bananas, man. So That's very cool. And also, if you're going, this type of edge is great. If you're going to, like this is the, the test that we did when uh, Masai-san was here too, the we were cutting the, you know, like those uh, um, cured ham. Oh, yeah, the, the, the uh, Kuroboto, right? Yeah, yeah, Kuroboto. Yeah, yeah. And when we, fit, when we were cutting with the, these little bit toothier edge, it breaks all the um, cells inside, then all the umami flavor came out. Huh. 
Probably creates a little more surface area. Exactly, and it just tears it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, right. right. It's not too bad, but. I wonder if that'd be good for cheese too. Yeah. Well, help with depends on type of cheese too, right? Like if the ones that crumbles, it this doesn't matter. Doesn't matter or brie, but but with like a firmer cheese, like a comte. Maybe oh comte, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So that's how I like to finish. This way, this the knife will keep the edge a little bit longer. Also makes the edge a little bit stronger too. And I'm just gonna finish with the leather strop. Okay, that was my next question. So you do strop it? Yeah. Would you strop on uh, chromium oxide or just suede? I do just use the suede. There's reason. The uh, well, chromium oxide first. I think it makes it the edge a little too smooth. We're not making a mirror polished edge or anything like that. This is the kitchen knife to cut the food with. So um, I like a little bit more toothier edge. Oh, I, wonder I wonder if that's, that's why I sometimes have trouble with my kitchen knives keeping their edge because mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm in the habit of using chromium oxide mm -hmm. coming from like a straight razor background. Yeah, yeah. It's really good at smoothing out burrs. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's great, right? Like when you cut the paper with the paper with the knife that finished with the uh, chromium oxide. Oh, it's it like, was awesome. Right? Like, yeah. It's so yeah. quiet. Yeah. And, and, this, and then it just skips across the tomato and you're like, what the hell did I do? Yeah, yeah exactly. So there are some different edges. Um, so this... The way I just finished this knife is going to be great. It's going to cut it into tomato skin, pepper skin, like green onions and stuff like that. Super, super easy. I don't think you would notice it tears as much as the uh, some people say they would. Um, definitely, though, like say if you are going to compare the, say when you cut the um, sashimi, right, like the, the raw fish, make it into slices, the edge that it cuts by this edge and the one finished with, say, 8,000, like Yanagiba, I usually finish with 8,000, the cut fish is going to last longer. The fish is going to last longer when you cut with a finer grit because it doesn't pair, it doesn't... You know, right, you don't get down. oxidization. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. I mean, we, that was the case with... Uh, even even with more delicate, like you say, you work in a restaurant. You know, mm -hmm. I, I worked in a French restaurant, and we uh, would chiffonade basil mm. for for garnish during service because we're not yep. doing that to order. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my basil versus the 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 one of the cooks who just never sharpened their mm -hmm, knives and mm -hmm. didn't think it was necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, not only was mine cut a lot finer, mm -hmm. but uh, it was it perfect. Like, like mm -hmm. you look at it the next day, and mm -hmm. it was still good. And theirs was like bruised and black mm -hmm. within thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just really the surface area, right? It is sharp enough. Probably is going to last, you know, during the service or a day or two, right? But in the longer term, that this you will definitely notice it. Right on. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on that before we get to a few questions? We've got lots of great questions going today. Keep them coming, folks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's that's that wraps for the first knife. I cool. Think. Well, I I did just I. This, this might be top secret, but I think I can say something. I did just get an email from Kevin saying that uh, we're, uh, we're locked in. We got a space in Toronto. Oh! Oh! So uh, we're hoping our, our tentative opening date is, is June 1st, but we'll see. Don't, we'll see. Don't, don't count on that. Don't. <laughs> we want to we wanna make the shop nice. We want to yeah, yeah, do yeah, it right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're really excited. We're Hopefully very excited. We'll be opening soon. Uh, we are going to be in the Annex area. If you're familiar with Toronto, I'm not, but that's that's the area we're in. It's 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 great. I've only been there once, but I still mm. I remember where where it was. Mm. Where I, I I basically the uh, they have the city bike, you know, like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And I was like biking around. We were we we're at the uh, uh, Royal Ontario Museum and going to um, uh, Korea Korea Town. It's on the same kind of line, mm. right? So mm -hmm. it's like it's really really nice. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we got some great questions mm. to catch up on. Uh, we'll start with the we'll, we'll start from the beginning, okay. um, just so we don't miss folks. So Brad Gray was wondering, mm -hmm. what is the best way to sharpen a Nigara Anmon? Mm -hmm. uh, congrats mm -hmm. if you have one of those without yeah, yeah. damaging the intricate Damascus pattern. Mm. The um, Anmon Damascus, basically how they did, how they pop that the uh, I guess pattern up is by the um, I, they they use like different acids. We use the um, ferric chloride acid so basically what they're made out of is the they have nickel and they have stainless steel they have nickel and stainless steel 
and they are all different hardness, right? So they layer them together and they cut, like in cut in diagonal, it's like, you know, when you're cutting the uh, uh, croissant mm -hmm. in, in, in diagonal, you see all the layers, right? Totally. But the, uh, usually when you polish them up, you can't really see those layers, so they right. dip it in uh, acid to melt a little bit. Okay. By melting a bit, though, like they melt, like some of the, they melt faster than others. Okay. That creates, that, that will pop the, the, uh, the pattern. Right. So um, I actually did the one uh, Masakage Kumo today. It basically needed lots of thinning and lots of grinding on the, on the side. So I ground them, mm -hmm. then I put it in that uh, ferric acid to get that. So it is possible. The um, It may not be feasible, I guess. Like it may not, like I don't think just regular uh, home cook will have the ferric chloride at home. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can buy it online, yeah. right? For, for acid etching. Yeah. yeah. But you can also, you know, like, we can also do that for you as well. Like we. Yeah, yeah. If you don't want to go down that rabbit yeah. hole, I mean, if you're already watching the show, you might be <laughs> you might be into the the nerd world or wanting to get into the nerd world mm -hmm. of knife sharpening. But if that's not you, um, we'd be happy to offer that service for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> somebody was just asking if we list the refurbished knives on our website for the garage sale. We will. We will. Yeah. The, uh, the, we're still hiding um, the product itself because I'm still working on a lot of stuff yeah. um, right now and nothing is final yet. <laughs> so uh, it, it, The sale's in about be. four and a half weeks, about a month. Yeah. starts on the 15th of May. Yeah. Uh, and so over the next four weeks, keep an eye on the website and there will yeah. be stuff added, added gradually. Um, yeah. If not later today, then probably on Monday, I'll put up a like garage sale heading mm -hmm. on the front page so you can link to that. And that, that'll be a place where you can start to preview the stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not available until the 15th, <coughs> um, but there's stock in store and on the website. And, uh, uh, oh, and the prices you see online, most of them are as marked, uh, with the exception of the stuff for the, the sales section. Yeah, sales section, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, the next question, Michael Ells is just asking about the Masashi Kuroshu. Mm -hmm. Same question as Brad. Like, how do you preserve that finish when you go to right. sharpen it? Right. So the uh, Masashi-san does it slightly different to get that finish out. He what he what he what he told us is that the uh, I I even asked once like, do you use those acid to get the those uh, finishes out? And he says no. It's like a lot of knife makers do use the acid and neutralize them after, but he's still worried about the that neutralization process. So what he said, well, I actually went to see him. So he polished them. He polished the side really, really nice and almost like a mirror. Then he put them in this box. Uh, it's a sandblast box. So the uh, the whole bunch of bee glass bees will shoot off from this nozzle, and they he he just touches on the, the bevel so it kind of um what you call that the uh, it scratch up the uh, bevel right but because he uses hard steel and softer steel in the layers softer steel gets scratched up so much not easier than the others we can't really do the exact same finish as he does but we could do very similar we do have the little uh, polishing powder to bring those uh, damascus up as well. So what we could do is to make the bevel really, what you could do is to make a bevel really nice and shiny, then use one of those paste or the uh, powders to bring those, um, the Damascus finish back up. The, uh, those polishing powder, uh, they are, we call it, we sell it as a Suihiro polishing powders mm -hmm. to bring those, um, those finishes back up. So it's not exactly the same thing, but the, you get a very similar finish to that. So that's S S U E H I R O. Mm. Sue Hero. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so, well, Paul L just said I need to sharpen my Nishida Desuki Shirogami mm. number one Guto nice. and Masamoto VG10. So this will be nice. a nice video to learn. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, Melanie Matson was just saying, looking forward to this lesson. Melanie mm. from SoCal. Thanks for mm. tuning in. Um, talking about the way we're sharpening a gyu toe mm -hmm. uh, on the edge, mm -hmm. um, the way you show, uh, Paolo L was just agreeing with you, the way you show mm -hmm. is the best in my opinion, because a lot of people have habits from European knives, the, mm -hmm. the kind of rocking motion. Mm -hmm. I know I I learned my knife skills originally from like the Food Network, mm -hmm. watching as a kid, mm -hmm. that like, rocking motion mm -hmm. that every chef used to do. Mm -hmm. 
And so, yeah, when you come down on that heel, mm -hmm. you need that strength. Mm -hmm. um, and just follow it up. They just follow it up with uh, strong back mm -hmm. and sharp front will be a good start to the adventure with Japanese knives after mm -hmm. changing from European ones. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Um, Hen Henrik was asking, do you apply the same amount of pressure on the leading and trailing strokes back, you know, back and forth on the stone? Or does it change with different knives, stones, etc.? That's a good question. And generally speaking, um, I do back and forth, but it's pressure on push motion. And there aren't that much pressure coming back, trailing back. It that doesn't have a lot of pressure. Push more, but make sure the edge uh, stays on the stone, if that makes sense. So it's like this if i exaggerate mm -hmm. but on the back i just put enough pressure that it still touches on the stone so it's the back right cool oh, no, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> uh trevor pinnicky was asking mm -hmm. uh just a quick question is a sharpening station worth it i.e. a dedicated tub with blocks, risers, and anti-slip matting. Mm. At home, for myself, I don't have dedicated space. I, if you're going to actually have, well, I mean, I don't, it comes handy. If you have that little container, right, like it's like um, something like this container, you mm -hmm. know, keep all your sharpening things in, then that comes handy. Like I usually bring it out to the kitchen where I have the source of water. Um, this is my sharpening uh, station. I wish I had actually running water because sometimes I would like to sharpen an under... It's, it's kind of breaking all the myth that the, there is, but the, uh, I do sometimes sharpen under running water. Sometimes. And depends on what kind of finishes you want. But, so I wish I had some like water source in my sharpening station right now, but the, um, yeah, not, not really. If you have like, you know, enough space in a garage with the, uh, with the plumbing and everything, go for it. I, yeah. <laughs> but, what, what I'll say is um, if you're sharpening knives at home, mm -hmm. uh, because Trevor followed up and said, as a beginner, we'll just make my sharpening more consistent. Mm -hmm. You need to have, uh, it's the same as using your knife on a cutting board. Like you need to have a decent setup mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to be fancy. But it needs to be at an appropriate height that you're not bending forward mm -hmm. or working awkwardly high. Mm -hmm. So you, your work surface needs to be at a comfortable height, probably kind of in line with your belt, mm -hmm. maybe, or a little higher, like yeah. belly button, um, somewhere around there. And your stone needs to be sturdy. Because when I started out, I just, you know, I, I didn't spend a lot of money. I just got a couple stones. And so I didn't have a stone holder. And so my stones were right against the counter and they were just on like a wet cloth. So the whole time I was trying to sharpen, they were sliding around and I was running my knuckles into the cutting board or at the countertop. And that's just a, a terrible way to sharpen. Mm -hmm. uh, you just won't do a good job. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> even, a great point. Yeah. You, even now, I couldn't do a, a, as good a job doing yeah. that. So yeah, you just need like the right height and sturdy and and stable yeah. and, and clearance for your hands. Yeah. As long as you have that, you're good. That's a great point, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah. I like a sink bridge for if you want running water. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if I'm just right sharpening at home on my countertop, which I often do, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just use a stone holder yeah. and a wet rag. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Rick is going to send uh, the uh, his, Amon. Uh, Amon yeah, off yeah. to us for sharpening. We have a mail-in sharpening service on our website, just mm -hmm. from the drop-down menu. Grant is asking a question here, and this might be. I think I saw you comment on YouTube earlier today, Grant. Um, why the running water? Is this for a mirror finish or for a Kasumi finish? Do you want more slurry, less water? Yeah, it's like less less slurry. The uh, When you're cutting, um, sometimes when you're using the uh, really, really coarse stone, um, sometimes you want it to uh, run, running. On, so like two, two things. When you are using the coarser stone, running the water will wash all the grits away really fast. It actually cuts a little bit faster. Um, to the uh, like a little bit finer stones, by running water, it kind of gives you a little bit more. Uh, it doesn't have the lot of slurries. Right? It washes all the slurries off, so it makes it a little bit nicer mirror polish. Um, yeah, that and it kind of gives you a little bit of different. 
each stone has different, um, I guess, you know, effect to it by doing it with a little bit of water or running water. That's what I learned from the Masashi Fujiwara-san. It's not the Masashi Yamamoto-san, but Masashi right. Fujiwara-san right. back in the, uh, yeah, back when I went to get a little bit lesson from him. He was like, do this with the running water. I'm like, oh, it's not something that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 no. It actually gives you a little bit of different finishes. I don't, I don't know if it was Mark Twain or, I mean, this quote's mis misattributed all the time and I'm probably going to get it wrong, but uh, they said, first, learn the rules and then distort them to your leisure mm. basically like yeah. figure it out do it right yep. and then start messing around with it yep. that's that's very true of knife sharpening okay one last one before we move on mm. to our intermediate shane said what do you think of leather honing wheels i use one to keep my knife sharp mm. like leather honing wheels are fine the i just i don't i guess like we, we don't have them <laughs> um mm. it's, it's fine just be careful you know right the angles and stuff because it goes pretty fast um yeah I think it's fine. It's fine to use the uh, nothing. I'm, I'm, I have nothing against that. The uh, Moritaka-san uses leather uh, wheel. I remember, yeah, cool. like for honing. So I'm like, ah, I don't know that that thing is a thing. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's like a very small oh. wheel with the leather yeah. on them. Faster than a straw. Like, okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you all for your questions. Yep. Keep them coming. But we are going to move on. Because we are on a bit of a timeline today. All right. Um, so, so next knife. Next what are we knife. Doing? Next knife is going to be this Koishi here. Um, Koishi, it's great. I'm going to be super stainless clad. This needs a little bit of what we call it the thinning. By thinning it, I um, great thing. Well, couple times I, I think last couple times I've been speaking what determines the sharpness. Right? Last couple times I'm probably talking about what determines sharpness. And when it comes to the kitchen knives, like I'm not talking about all other, you know, cutting tools, but when it comes to kitchen knives, what, it deter what determines the sharpness is one, like I did on this guy here, edge sharpness, how thin, how, what angle you're sharpening, that's the apex, how, how, what angle you're sharpening. That's the one. And also this, too, how coarse the edge is. What, you know, how, how it bites, how it slides, how it bites, right? Three, how thin the edge, like just behind the edges, right? Even if you make a really, really nice, like, 15-degree edge, if that the edge... The right behind the edge is a little bit thick. What can happen is that when you're cutting into the potatoes, the yams, it just kind of start to split. Right. Yeah, yeah it, it just doesn't, doesn't feel sharp. sharp. It's, it's like, like it's like, like a, an axe versus, versus a razor. Yeah. Is the comparison we always go. Yeah. Through. And a four. Not so doesn't really apply when it when you're cutting very like leafy vegetables, but it applies when you're cutting like meats and other stuff. How smooth your the side is. Right. right? You don't want to make it too, um, depends on what you, your, what you like to do, I guess, like mirror polish ones, it glides smoother, right? Obvious, for obvious reasons. But because of that, the mirror polishness, it gets stuck. It can stick on the blade really easy. So you kind of have to find the good, I guess like, you know, midpoint, middle point. Right? So, what I'm going to do is to take this knife. Today, I'm not going to uh, focus anything on, say, you know, making a kasumi finish or anything like that. I'm more doing that, um, you know, bevel um, geometry. Okay? So, right, focusing more on the shape of the, of exactly. the blade. So, you know, first sharpening, I was all, only focusing on the uh, last edge, the, uh, you know, direction as well as the coarseness as well as how thin, this I'm going to sharpen, well, I'm going to actually thin them, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so for those of you, if you're watching and you are new to Japanese knives, you don't know that much about Japanese knives, <coughs> um, they, they're kind of sharpened in two different, at two different angles. Um, when they make the knife, you basically just have a flat, 
piece of steel with more or less parallel sides, and it's just, it's just totally blunt on the edge. So if you just sharpen the edge of that knife, you don't have a very thick piece of steel. And so they bevel the knife down. And can you just show us the bevel there, Naoto? Yes. Sorry, maybe this is faster. Okay. Yes, yeah, so they just grind a bevel on either side so that the blade comes down to a, a point, but mm -hmm. it's much thinner behind the edge and and just helps the knife glide more smoothly. Mm -hmm. And so it's sharpened on that bevel, like Nauta's doing now, and it's sharpened on the edge. Yeah. So right now Nauta's got the, the knife flat on the stone, basically. Yeah, exactly. So I don't raise anything, I just put the flat on the bevel and grind the bevel down. What it does is that the it will make the edge thinner, so when it when this comes into, I guess entering into the food, it glides them nicer. It, it's it doesn't wedge them when you, um, it happens. You probably have noticed that when you're cutting a yam uh, or a squash, right? Even if you even the sharpest edge, it the it splits. It's like an axe, right? If that the edge is a little bit thicker. What I'm going to do, I've probably done a few times on uh, setting this isn't too good of an example, but um, it's the same thing. You want to ha be this knife to be a as multifunctional as possible, and I've done it a few times. I think the uh, 3D sharpening thing that I did, like. Is that a recorded version or was it the... Yeah, uh, that's a video you did last fall. And was it recorded or the... Uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's, okay. that's just a regular video. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Yeah, so that's... The, it's, I it's, can't, I can't the, the opening's sometimes. pretty goofy, but it's a, it's a really interesting video because now to talk about it, mm. you know, the way that he likes to sharpen the bevel. So we're going back, back and watching after this. Yeah, so the uh, what happens is that the uh, knives, especially the hand-forged knives, there isn't, like, as much as they try, there isn't any part that is like straight or flat or true in that kind of mm -hmm. sense they use you know hammers to forge out into shape they use the wheel to sharpen so that the bevel could be a little bit more concaved um, and also it has the usually has a taper the thickness on the spine from the, the where it attaches the handle and to the uh, tip is a little bit different um, usually it tapers it downwards this one is slightly weird, actually. This one, but usually tapers down from the heel to spine, right? So it's not like you know, it's not two dimensional. It's all three dimensional. Mm -hmm. That that is why I think it's important to sharpen in three dimensional way. What that means, like when I asked the massage son, also the massage Yamamoto son, like you know, what's the, what does he, I guess. What is he careful about when you, when he's sharpening or creating, say, petty or the any gutos? And he was like, he always remember that the knife is there isn't any like flat spot. Mm -hmm. It's all like either torsion. It's it's flat, but it's twisted. It's everything right. So keep that in mind if you want to learn more about the uh, 3D sharpening. You know, watch the video, uh, maybe like in the description, or just Nathan can just throw the, uh, yeah, throw the link I'll, I'll, in. Yeah, uh, I'll find a link. Sometimes it doesn't like when I put links in there. But, but the um, what it is basically is the same thing as the, the previous, uh, the way that I sharpened it previously. What that means is that I'm going to make the bevel, thinner bevel at the, he at the tip and a thicker bevel at the tip. Oh, no, the other way, sorry. Thinner bevel, thin here at the tip, a little bit thicker on the heel. What, it, what I'm going to do is to press down on a little bit more bevel side. Like if you look here, instead of pressing down at the edge part, I'm just going to move my finger up on the bevel, up on the shinogi line, this line here, then sharpen at the tip where at the heel, I move my fingers down. I will focus more on that the uh, heel part, then sharpen here. Okay, I, I popped the four-dimensional sharpening video into the. Uh, oh yeah, four-dimensional. The description. Can't forget the fourth dimension time. Yes, the time. 
So I'm not going to today like make this like all pretty and everything because it needs <laughs> more time. Yeah, we're we're focused mostly on on shaping the edge, and if you do want to get more into how to polish it, uh, we've got a ton of videos on that you can check out on the channel. So, well, you got a bit of time for questions yeah, yeah, yeah. while you're doing that. So, Powell L was asking about the first sharpening technique mm -hmm. you did, you know, just on the edge. Does this also work well with Hado knives? I have a 210 Sumi Guto. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm asking for the future. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the Sumi uh, lines uh, depends on when you got your Sumis. I have been talking to Mariyama san, who is a sharpener of Hado, quite some time. And he has been implementing this torsion sharpening quite a bit. Mm. I have uh, his uh, two, 210, and he does it a little bit more exaggerated manner than I can do, mm. but it's super thin at the tip and slightly thicker. At, it's, but um, I, I just got to say, like, if you are looking for a kick-ass Japanese knife that isn't crazy expensive, get a hot out. They're so cool. Yeah. I, I got I got the bunka the sumi bunka yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with a really high bevel, yeah. ooh, two months ago. Yeah, and it's I got to tune up the edge just a tiny bit, but it's amazing. So you can definitely do that because how or I'll, I'll give you a little bit of some weird um, advice on that one too, because how he sharpens he makes the um, the bevel at the tip. <coughs> Thinner, much thinner than the heel, like I'm doing. You could do it. You could do the sharpening on the, the lower, at, but he already done it for you. Mm. And because of the how he did the thinning on the tip, you could, you could. It's it's don't don't get me wrong. You could do the sharpening the way I sharpen, but you don't have to because of he. Thin the tip a lot more than the other people do. It is a little bit more fragile, so you could just sharpen it in a regular way to just keep this. It's I guess the uh, strength on the tip. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, if you don't want the tip to be too delicate. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, and Powell, let us know when you got your hado because that might affect things a little bit. JP had a good question. We got some great answers from people in chat. Are Fujiwara Denka knives worth the price? Uh, I would say 100%. I, I have a 210 Denka Guto that I use pretty much every day. Nato sharpened it on our last live video. And if you want to hear more Denka talk, definitely go back and watch that one. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say so. I mean, it's there's a little bit of that diminishing returns thing. Like, yeah. you know, when you, when you get like a $600 bottle of scotch, is it six times better than a $100 bottle of scotch? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I didn't cut with my Denka and immediately go, wow, this is, you know, five times better than a $200 knife. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I was immediately impressed. And it, it, I love using the knife. It's a joy to use and it's made by such a cool guy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, part of what you're paying for is the romance and all the work that mm -hmm. went into it. So, if you're into that kind of thing, then it's absolutely worth it. Um, if you're looking for just like the most utilitarian, stay sharp forever knife, maybe not. But uh, if you love handmade knives, then you, you need, then you need a Denka. Yeah, I, I think I second second Nathan. The uh, it's it's not like it is not the uh, cheapest knives around, um, and I would say it's not like it's not the prettiest knives around, <laughs> right? Uh, that, that's got, why I like it. <laughs> it's got a little character to it, um, but you know. It, it has the old stories, you know, like Kevin went to visit him, like, you know, yeah. about hey. two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, because he was there for his the anniversary of his 150th yeah, company, year. 150, uh, yeah, company. Yeah, the company. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's going back to, like, a whiskey analogy. Um, I, I don't like the whiskeys that are, like, perfectly balanced and smooth. Like, mm -hmm. that's how some people value whiskey, and that, that's totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. They want the smoothest, cleanest, whatever. Um, I want the ones that punch you in the face a little more and are a little mm. more fiery. And the dank is definitely that knife, mm. um, but it's it's also still drives like a. You know, it's got a, yeah, it's got a. He's got a his personality as well, right? His own personality. You know, mm -hmm. he came to visit us and. Yeah, I mean that was what sold me was when he was here. I I always wanted one and thought they were cool, but it wasn't until I actually met him 
Right. That I was like, okay, I have to have a knife for this guy because he's, he's awesome. Well, Powell L says, yep, legendary knife. Uh, Rick has two Denkas, and they're awesome. Rick, you're shaping up to have a pretty awesome knife collection there. <laughs> Worth every penny and then some. Uh, and, okay, i got to figure out how to say your name. Ezekarias, I'm sorry, uh, says, get it once, cry, or get it, cry once, smile forever. <laughs> That's usually my philosophy when it comes to spending money, <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, Trevor Binicky had, was thought that was interesting what you said about the mirror polish. I never, uh, I never noticed that when I'm breaking down large protein, I use a mirror polish blade. Mm -hmm. Never thought about it sticking. Yeah, the uh, not so much in protein, mm -hmm. right? When you're cutting a, uh, when you're cutting a the cucumber. The cucumber. <laughs> Definitely. The uh, depends on again what you are cutting. The um, like squash and zucchini. Those yeah, are really like, sticky. Yeah, yeah, like carrots too, right? The uh, the basic, yeah, like a lot of veggies, they like to stick to it. And if you watch it until the end or the next to this guy, I have something interesting. <laughs> so. Because, like, we get a lot of requests saying, like, do you have any knives that, you know, the food never sticks? There isn't. Um, if the knife is the... Um, get a cheese wire. Yeah. Yeah. Or the axe. You know, if it just peel, splits like that, it will never, yeah. right? But you never get a really pleasant feeling of uh, cutting either. So, um, but I think I got something similar close enough. So, like, again, I just switched the hand. Uh, I'm putting more pressure right here. Almost like it looks like it, the edge of the knife is not touching on the stone. But I, as I come down on the heel, I put the full pressure at the heel. So making that the... Shane says, I noticed not one video about global knives are down cool. Not at all. Uh, we love global, but we try to specialize more on stuff that's a little trickier to get mm -hmm. in North America, just so that we can bring in stuff that people that people can't get. Mm -hmm. and global are, you know, relatively yeah. easy to acquire. So, um, I think did we used to sell them. Yeah, we used to. Yeah, we used yeah. to sell them. Um, but yeah, it's just you know we only have so much space because we have brick and mortar stores and stuff. So, yeah, uh, we don't carry them currently, but they're great. As they get, yeah, they're they're great. The um, they are great to sharpen. But, um, yeah. Sorry, I realized my mic was muted. Global knives, great. We don't carry them because they're fairly easy to get in most places. Uh, we specialize more in, in a little more rare handmade stuff, but great knives. Yeah, they're great knives. The um, We found lots of our clientele, I guess, the uh, people who come to our stores, they're not so into those metal handles. That's another thing, too. The, uh, yeah. I think many people now, their picture, you know, 20 years ago is totally different. But nowadays, right. people's picture of a, of a Japanese knife mm -hmm. is, you know, often something that's hand forged, uh, has a wooden handle, maybe a little more rustic finish. And so people kind of come in expecting that right. for the most part. And we do have great knives for, like, professionals or people who want something more utilitarian, you know, the Tojiro DP, mm -hmm. even the Tojiro Color Series. Okay, now I got a question related to exactly what you're doing right now. Oh, yeah. uh, John Sarge, hi from the UK. How do you know when you've thinned down the tip enough compared to thinning down the heel enough? Is it just by feel? Um, right now, yes. Um, I'm, I'm basically using my fingers to see the angles and angles here. You once you sharpen enough knives, you start to feel like angle that you're sharpening here and here are different. Yeah. Because you don't want to make it too thin, mm -hmm. and it's pretty, you'll know when you've made your knife too thin, <laughs> and I, I hate mm -hmm. to say that, but um, yeah, John, it's just, I, w I would err on the side of not thinning enough, you know, thin your knife a little bit, and then cut with it, and see how it cuts, go yeah, cut some carrots. The, yeah, exactly. The um, Don't waste time polishing a whole bunch, just go cut something. Yeah, that, that's really good, good advice, actually, the, um, you know... Cut into the carrots and, you know, even the, you don't have to put the edge on. The, it's thin enough that you, you will be able to cut the carrots without, without any issues, right? Mm -hmm. All right, where are we at? 
So here, I switched the hand earlier. Um, I was focusing on more of thinning, making the edge block thinner or the bevel thinner at the tip and a bit more at the thicker at the heel. So it's on the back. Here. Now, Rick was asking, is that the same bevel technique, tip versus heel geometry, that you used in your single bevel video? Yes, yes. Yeah, this is, this, you, know, you watch more than a, one or two of our videos, you'll mm -hmm. come to notice this is pretty standard for us mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. Yeah, the, um, if you don't do it, what can happen, especially for single bevels, is that the, uh, you will have this shinogi line comes up quite a bit. Well, one good example actually sitting in the back, but the, I wouldn't show that to you guys. But uh, yeah, the um, it's just really very common technique. We learned the uh, you know we learned it from a lot of blacksmith knife makers as well as we learned the hard way as well. Because you know first couple of while I remember I was sharpening it. And the, this line, this shinogi line, or this grinding line, comes up like this. Mm. And I was wondering, why does that? Right? So that's the... Uh, we learned the hard way a few times, but here is... Alrighty, so... Pretty nice and even. I made it nice and thin. Here, I usually check it with my two fingers, see if it's thin enough. I could go a little bit thinner, but because of the time that we have, I'm going to actually... But the idea really is to make the tip thinner, slightly stronger at the heel here. And as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the how smooth... This start, like the side of the knife also affects the sharpness of the edge, right? Because it goes through them. If it, the side is too rough, it can, um, it can drag them a little bit. Or so, so you can decide which, what kind of finish you want. Often I do it like you can make it really smooth. I usually finish them like um, 1,000 to 3,000 finish so that it glides through a little bit easier. This is 1,000 grit. Same thing, the, apply the pressure at the heel, a little bit to more of the shinogi line here. Shinogi is this grinding line. Then torsion, twist. My finger goes from here to here. So it's the back. Sorry about that, Naoto. No worries. Okay, um, I don't know which camera I was talking to, but... Um, yeah, well, we, we can see your face still. Okay, oh no, I mean, I don't know if it's overhead camera. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I yeah, know the overhead, I left the overhead. Oh, okay, yeah. so, yeah, it's the same thing again. A little bit of, like, I, I mm -hmm. usually finish again with the little bit more finer, because that the, how smooth the side will affect how, how it cuts the food. Gotcha. Okay, you got time for a question or two? Mm -hmm. Well, our buddy Grant Hendrick is uh, uh, being our wingman here and saying, don't forget to like this live stream. Oh. Give, it, give it a like. If you haven't watched, subscribed to our channel, we would love if you did that. We've got a great video with Sky, who is our videographer, um, but she's been showing up on camera a little more often. Uh, it's coming out on Monday about a Santoku. Pretty beginner information uh, for, for those of you that are familiar with this stuff, but uh, it's going to be worth a watch. 
and uh, yeah, and then another one the following week with uh, with Kevin. Kevin, yeah. Yeah, talking about his trip to Japan. It's going to be a long video. It's probably going to be like a half hour long. No. Uh, where he's going to be telling stories, talking about, you know, uh, hanging out with Fujiwara san in an onsen. Right, and, right, right. Uh, all sorts of good stuff like that. How great it was to go back, right? How great it was to go back to Japan. Because yeah. he hadn't been since 2019. Yeah. Like, spring, October, I think, 2019. Hopefully he, hopefully he didn't get in trouble getting into the onsen. What's that? Hopefully he didn't have any trouble getting into the onsen. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was okay. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> I did hear about that time that he, he had some trouble. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I lied. We don't have a lease uh, for Toronto yet, but uh, oh. we're, you yeah, know, still working on it. Okay. Yeah, we're very excited to be open there. Uh, Brock Stone is asking, what is your opinion on belt sanders the, uh, to sharpen, for example, the Ken Onion Elite? Um, I think just for sharpening in general, uh, do we use belt sanders in knife wear? The uh, belt sanders, we use them for a few finishes. I do, we do not use um, belt sander for, especially when it comes to the, uh, the edge sharpening, last edge sharpening, we do not use that. One, if you have, say, knife maker sharpening machine, like belt sanders, that can um, control the speed, control the... Um, control those things um, that may be fine right some belts don't heat up as much as the other belts so but generally speaking the uh, regular belt sanders that runs on the one speed setting they're too, way too fast way too aggressive for most of Japanese mm -hmm. knives so the um, we do use them for some finishing touches <laughs> for example to make it the uh, Make it a grinding line a little bit more even. Like say I, I just did it for Tojiro. I send it, so and you know, they use those grinding much more automated grinding machines, right? To make it, it <laughs> the um, grinding line vertical. Right. But we don't have them and we have the ver ours is pretty slow, um, bell sounder. So I put that on the flat. Make sure that it doesn't heat up as much. Because heating, heat up in the steel will soften the steel. So oh, I, I got to interrupt. I, I didn't see this comment. Oh, it's only two minutes old. Naoto and gang, will you still be going 35 minutes from now if I show up with beer? This guy, Kevin, wants to come here with some beer. I think that's probably okay. Yeah. 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 His glasses are here too, so he should probably come get them. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you soon, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. The, the belt center is a great tool. It's just not something we use a whole ton. No, not all the time. The uh, I'm not again. Like again, as I said, you know, I'm not against using the belt sanders. Like there are belt sanders like three hundred, three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars for it's called the knife makers belt sanders, right? Mm -hmm. And they they are longer, so that it doesn't retain as heat as right, much. Right. Yeah. Oh, so um, the belt doesn't retain heat. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, I've seen them. So those are fine, and also I think they have variable speed setting too. Mm -hmm. So they're fine, but it's you know, if you're just talking about you know sharpening at home with regular bail standards, I wouldn't. Yeah. Cool. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, where are we at? So I just, I guess, like finished the bevel. It's not as even as like my polishing videos because I'm not really focusing on that today. Um, Smooth enough that should glide through the food really nice. Thin enough here and there. So I'm just going to put the edge on. Right on. And uh, we do have some carrots and tomatoes that we will test all three of these knives yeah, yeah. on later. Okay, and so the, this edge you're going to do the same as before, right? The Yes, this I will do the same as before. Okay. The When I do, like the... Uh, who, 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 has, who had the, uh, the Hado? Uh, that was Powell L. from yeah. Poland, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you have like and a, and uh, just got that Hado Sumi a month ago, by the way. Okay. So if you had a Hado Sumi or something like that, very extreme, I guess, has the, uh, the coarse, like the tip is a lot thinner than the heel, I would either do at the uh, very same angle all the way across because the tip is a little bit more fragile. Something like this, that the core steel is exposing about the same 
right? The core steel is only like exposed in about two to three millimeters there. Mm -hmm. uh, this, when you see very consistent exposure of the core steel in the knife, I would probably, for the Yuto, I would do more, like say, lower the tip and higher the heel type of technique. So it, it really depends on, you know, the condition as well as the, um, what you want and what you want from the knife, right? Like that's really important. What are you doing with that knife? Right. Yeah. The, the, the job you're doing, you know, if you are getting more advanced, the sharpening should dictate the way that you sharpen. Yeah. What are you cutting too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how much of it and how often, like, are you are you using your knife for 20 minutes a day or using your knife for 10 hours a day? Yeah. Uh, those will be different kinds of edges. If I was, if I, you know, God forbid, ever went back to work in a restaurant, um, I would probably just sharpen my knives at 400 grit mm -hmm. and probably never go beyond that unless I yeah. had to slice some sashimi. The, um, you know, there is a lot, like, it's a school of thought as well. Japanese chefs, the uh, sushi chefs, they do sharpen them their knives every single day. Oftentimes, but the um, in the last couple of years, this dry aging or aging a uh, fish, even the uh, those uh, even those like for sushi grade uh, fish, mm -hmm. they still do age them. Mm -hmm. And by aging them, you know the amino acid breaks it down and gets more umami, right? Mm -hmm. So for those fish, I think it, it will it will be beneficial to cut with something a bit more toothier edge. Because as soon as it touches you know, touches the tongue, right. it explodes with the flavors. Yeah, yeah, it's a totally different, totally different thing. I know a lot of chefs do this, like you know, slice them. Yeah. Then they make a scores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right? Yeah, and that one, especially if you have. For example, a fancy soy sauce, like mm -hmm. the stuff that we're getting. Oh, yeah. uh, you probably want a little more surface area for that to cling to. You don't want it to just like run right off mm -hmm. of your, exactly. your fish. It, it's, it's probably important to note, too, that the way that fish are killed for that sort of thing is, is very different. And so the, the, the meat lasts a lot longer mm -hmm. compared to like the suffocation method that we use in North America. Or, you know, if you're fishing on a lake, then just bashing it over the head with a Mm. With, a, with an adjust, adjustable wrench like my uncle. Right, right, right. But, the, um, uh, it's very different from, and, and allows the fish to last much longer than what we're used to. In the lots, of, lots of people do it in a way that the, it doesn't, you know, it, for some people it, it could be a little like offensive because it, it, it looks like it's, it's, the fish is suffering mm. when it's done this called ikejime right. uh, process. It's, but, but I mean, the, the way that, I mean, I guess bonking it over the head is probably relatively humane, but like the mm. putting it, you know, sometimes they, they're just left to suffocate, which is mm, that, not that's, the most humane way no, to, no, to no, kill no, a no, fish no. either. Like if you have, you know, a large ocean caught fish, like that's, mm -hmm. that's how it's killed. So, but it, it's, right. it's really practical, right? Yes. Like, it's really important. Like two, two things are very important when it comes to aging fish. One is really the, uh, ikejime to, um, Instant, instantaneously kills and also breaks all the uh, nerve system mm -hmm. so that it doesn't um, stops the muscles from spasming right because yeah. when the muscles are left to like go crazy and expand and contract then yeah, it, yeah. It, like, yeah. you don't want to see like you know like fish jumping all around yeah, right? Cause cause it, it hits all, all bruised, yeah, bruised and mushed and... exactly and also how to um, um, how to I guess like drain all the blood out that, mm -hmm. that's really really important which is something we do with every animal, other animal, oh, yeah, like yeah, land, yeah. land animals and birds. So yeah, why yeah, wouldn't yeah. we do that with yeah. with a fish, right? Yeah. So it's it's really important. So when it's done really right, they can last. I've seen like aged twenty eight aged. I I haven't tasted. It. I'm not. I've, but twenty eight aged the twenty eight days aged uh, tuna mm. and stuff like that. Well, I, I saw. I, I watched a YouTube video on Ikejime and they, they just did a side by side comparison where they bought like some, you know, store bought salmon or mm -hmm. tuna and and compared the two and mm -hmm. they just let both of them sit in the fridge for yeah, a yeah, week yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. there was a noticeable difference, we'll yep. say that. Uh uh Prichaya Ford was asking, 
It's an interesting comparison. What about Fujiwara versus Masashi? They're pretty different. Yeah. I like how uh, Masashi cuts, like the little mm. toller bevel. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more straighter, so it glides mm -hmm. a little bit nicer. The um, smoothness of the edge, the uh, out of box, Fujiwara's crazy smooth. Mm -hmm. He sharpens it. The, the way he sharpens is that he sharpens. I, I think I did that last. Last year, yeah, that was right? our last live stream. Both yeah, the, uh, it's like he sharpens a super, super low angle, mm. so it's it cuts and it glides into him so nice. Yeah, it's kind of like comparing, like saying, you know, gin or whiskey. Mm. Like, well, both <laughs> <laughs> depends on your taste. Yeah. I do. I do depends have both budget. too. Right? I do have um, <coughs> Fujiwara uh, Nashiji, mm -hmm. and I have um, Masashi. A few Masashis. Right? Yeah. So. I have, I have a Denka and a Kokuin, but mm -hmm. I, think, I think I need one of those Kaijin for sure. Yeah, Kaijin's good. They're, they're awesome. Um, okay, we got a bunch more questions. So, yeah. uh, Sean Buckle, long-time viewer, uh, have either one of you guys used uh, one of the Isamitsu Aogami Super Gyutos? I haven't. We have we don't have Aogami Super one, but mm. we have uh, some white carbon steel. Yeah. We went to wa we went to see him, right? The um, We, I mean, I... Yeah. Was I was that Mike there? No, that was me. It was only me. Yeah, that was my solo trip. So I went to see those Isamitsu guys, the uh, the Yuki san and uh, what's what's the Abe san, Abe san and anyways, those guys are cool. The uh, they used to work for the Fujiwara, so the style in which he, they make knives are very similar to what the Fujiwara does, except the uh, they you know since they are just by themselves now, right? They 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 put other thoughts and you know things into their making knives as well. So their knives in general, it's the bevel is the less of the convex, slight. It is still convex, but it's a little bit more like straighter, flatter type of convex. So entry may you may feel is smoother. Mm. So yeah, there, there's some no, noticeable similarities and some noticeable differences. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The bevel is done a little bit more nicer, less grainy. Yeah. 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 So. Well, because they're they're you know they're they're intentionally cross pollinating with other makers and yeah, going yeah, to visit yeah. other blacksmiths. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And learn and pick up techniques for them. So, oh no, is there a sriracha bottle dead? There is a, some hole. Oh, no. I'll have to I finish the one I have at home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he served us well. Uh, okay, so Shane was saying lately I've been hooked on cleavers. I've mm -hmm. noticed not too many videos about them on YouTube. Mm -hmm. well, I'll tell you what, Shane, we have this guy named yeah. Colin who works for us, who is a cleaver maniac. Yeah. He he loves cleavers, assuming you're talking about the Chinese cleaver mm -hmm. and not like a butchery cleaver. Um, but he knows a ton about mm -hmm. Chinese cleavers, and I am going to share a video of his in the chat uh, where he teaches you just about everything you need to know, mm -hmm. including some really spot on Cantonese pronunciations. Mm -hmm. Um, and he had, we did another video with him just like last month where he tried out some cl crazy cleaver skills from mm -hmm. the internet, uh, and just kind of had fun. So you can learn there. That's a good jumping off point. Um, KB just said, uh, I haven't tuned into one of these live sessions for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy to see you guys still doing them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, John Sarge asked, asked what grit stone are you using at the moment. Um, it depends on which one we're using now. This is a while ago. Okay. But you can see, if you look into the like, YouTube shopping section, uh, you can see all of the stones that Nauta is using linked. So far, you've used what? The Nanawa Diamond? Diamond. I Diamond use the 400. Yeah, 400. And Knife Work 220 for uh, initial thinning. I use the um, Knife Work 1000 ish, mm. one, very similar stone. So the light, the, uh, the light brown was the diamond four hundred. The yeah. pink one was the knife wear two twenty. Yeah. And the darker brown was the knife wear one thousand. Kind, like it's similar. It's not similar. The, <laughs> the last it's, brown it's one not, they yeah. used. It's not exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Will Cito said, "Interesting that you're alternating sides when you're working on the tip of the knife. What does the benefit? Does that help make it more symmetrical? I think that was when you were thinning it, maybe." I think it was after you'd done most of the thinning. Mm -hmm. Did you thin a little more and kind of go back and forth? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to make sure that the tip is thin enough, right. too. Yeah. But you also wanted to make sure it was balanced, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah, symmetrical. Yeah. yeah, so that's correct, Will. Just making it symmetrical. 
Uh, Shane says, I kicked myself for not stopping by the shop when I was in Ottawa on business. I'm in San Diego. Well, we do ship to the States for yeah. over 200 bucks. Um, but we have stores in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, uh, to and Toronto. Toronto, hopefully in like a month. Yeah. Uh, well, no, probably more like a month and a half, two yeah. months, but soon. Yeah. So next time you visit Canada, hopefully it's one of those cities. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, city down there though. When, when they're uh, in yeah, the last really summer. Yeah, San Diego is beautiful. Oh, San Diego. I thought San, you no, no, San Diego. It's, yeah, I want to go to San beautiful. Diego like, too. I was like at the ocean area and they had a market and they, they were selling the tuna off the boat. I'm like, that's a dream. Okay, now I really want to go to San yeah. Diego. <laughs> um, Michael L. said, is the thinning easier on more of a convex ground blade or uh, more of a wide bevel? Mm, like a wider, usually wider bevel. the um, any kitchen knives Japan, especially though on the Japanese they are a little bit of convex right the um, there isn't any like anyone that I like especially because of the tools that they use they aren't any like super super flat grind even with the taller beveled ones they do have a bit of a convex to it um, convex yeah convex to it so it really depends Depends. The definitely those convex blades, you would have to sharpen them. Well, you have to spend a little, a lot more time because it, you know, it's more surface area that you have to grind, right? Um, like if you compare it to like narrow bevels, like uh, Moritaka mm. or the Takedas, it is definitely easier to, um, you know, sharp. They like sharpen. Yeah, those really narrow ones can yeah. be challenging. But if it's a really, really high one, and especially when it exposes a lot of core steel, it could be a little bit more challenged. Like because a Hado, for example? Hado, sometimes Tak Takada-san as well. They, some of them, they expose too much of the core. Um, they could be challenging because Japanese knives, as you, like a lot of you know, are consist of the, consist of hard steel and softer steel on the outside, right? And... What the softer steel does, not only to protect the uh, steel from breaking, but also it creates the knife that's easier to sharpen. Softer steel grinds much faster than hard steel. Right. Yeah. So the um, Aogami Super like this, if you have the knife with the uh, steel that's really exposed quite a bit, the core steel does not, I guess... The, I guess, I, they, they don't be they don't be they don't like to be ground down as fast, so um, it takes a little bit longer. So that's the um, that's a little bit of thing about those um, things <laughs> things. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay, Gabrielle was asking, would you use different pressure for carbon steel versus stainless on the stone? Not necessarily. The um, you don't have to put a lot of pressure down. Um, it really depends on whether you're sharpening um, just the regular sharpening like that last edge or the um, thinning. Thinning process could be a little bit of different type of, depends on type of steel you're sharpening. But the um, even if you push it too hard down, it won't do like faster job. Um, so like if you're using just those stones, just do it consistent, <coughs> that's probably the, the best way. Mm. Okay. Cool. All righty. Awesome. Um, can you use the same technique that you've been using today mm -hmm. for Masashi Kaijin Sentoku? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The uh, I actually did the uh, repair the other day with the Kaijin, and his, his knives grind qu quite nice. It is hard, um, so it takes a little bit of time. The... But I, what I did was the I used the initial grinding with the wheel. Then I, yeah, it did actually pretty good polishing off with the, um, oh, I did use the Knifeware 1000 for fogging. And I used some uh, Superstone 3000 for uh, polishing. So it, it, it did work. It did actually respond very good. Response basically means you can, you can feel them if if, if the grind the stone is not doing anything. It feels like it's sliding. It you, you can feel them if it's not doing anything. Cool, right on. Yeah. Um, Shane said you should sell a signature knifeware knife. 
Well, I'll tell you what, Shane, we did used to have one, and I'm going to pop a little video in the chat here where we show off Nauto, myself, and Sky show off our collections, oh, yeah. our, our knife collections. And do you have a knife for a knife? Yeah, 270 yeah. Gyoto. Yeah, and, yeah. and so both of us have a knife for a knife that yeah. we show off in that video. Um, we don't, that line isn't made anymore. Um, there are a couple that are collaborations or exclusive mm. to us, like the Moritaga Ishime line, which actually is just restocking right now, uh, is exclusive mm -hmm. to us. The Hado Sumi started off as a collaboration, right? Kind, kind of, like we, uh, we gave the idea. Right, yeah. 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 We give the idea, and that's how he started it. Yeah. It's not. I, I. don't think it's official, but it's definitely. I have all the records. <laughs> <laughs> no. We 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 do love collaborating with blacksmiths, yeah. and so we'd love to have another knife for a line at some point, probably. We like to you know throw the um, ideas to the uh, blacksmith and knife makers as well. Yeah, we want it to be a two way street where we're kind of building yeah. together. Yeah. How about this? How about you know that like. The uh, Masashi's uh, Honosuke is like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're all... Or, or even the Masakari Nakiri. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. People love that Nakiri because it's taller mm -hmm. than a traditional Nakiri. It's the reason I love it because Kevin told, you know, told the guys, hey, like, you know, I got big hands and a lot of chefs do too. Yep. You should make your Nakiri's a little taller. And, yep. and they did, and it's great. And it's a hit. People love it now. Yeah. Uh, Powell said, my YouTube library is growing fast. It's already full of your helpful videos. <laughs> well, thank you. Good. <laughs> it's always good to come back to topics when you need something to, uh, to do something with us. That's our goal is just to be a, a reference for yeah. people, help people learn. Uh, there's a ton of information that we have and we figure we shouldn't hoard that. Mm -hmm. uh, we should, we should share it with people. Uh, John just asked again about the stone that we used. Mm -hmm. Um, so the pink stone was the knife for 220 grit and that is linked in the youtube shopping thing but uh yeah it's, it's on our website it's part of our our house brand of, of stones which yeah. are really awesome kind of middle of the road affordable but high quality mm -hmm. uh what grit do certain blacksmiths this is spoon monkey mm -hmm. regular viewer yeah, yeah what grit do certain blacksmiths use for the out of the box edges mm -hmm. is it true a 500 grit wheel creates more of like a 2000 grit whetstone edge great the, question depends on who you are actually speaking to massage some i i, I know massage because we went to visit them quite often <laughs> yeah. i know massage some finishes with the uh, 1500 grit um 1500 1500 1, uh, grit stone to finish his edges the, it's a spinning stone. It, it will give you a little bit more finer edge and feel than the using the regular like brick of stones. If it spins with the water, um, it gives you a little bit more smoother edge. I'm not sure if it's like as I guess extreme as like 500 to 2000, but definitely like say um, 1500 to you probably feel like a 3000. Mm. It's probably not like four times like the some people would say but it may feel like a double cool. smoothness yeah it's, it's definitely quite different it's surprising yeah um powell said uh just a professional when i was cooked for seven years but mm -hmm. now i cook for me and my wife usually it's vegetables to meat sometimes fish mm -hmm. same here I'm, yep. I'm much happier cooking at home <laughs> um grant was asking does thinning differ in terms of time or grits needed depending if the San Mai cladding is iron, stainless, or a mix like a Damascus finish. Yeah, the um, time varies. Depends on how, well, what the, the outer layers, different components, but also, like, one, what is the core steel is made out of, like Aogami Super, is def or the other stainless steel, like VG10 stainless steel, are definitely much harder to be ground, harder to be grind, than uh, than the steels like white carbon steel, as well as the outer layer steel. If they use the steel on outside, that's like um, that's harder. It's harder to gr be ground. Regular, you know, carbon steel. It's a little bit easier to be um, grind. Um, like say, Masashi-san's knife, Kaijin and Kokuen, Sanmai steel. They're relatively easier to sharpen. Where his um, kok, his uh, kuroshu and shiroshu, they're a little bit hard because he uses the SUS three forty 
stainless steel, 330, sorry, SES 330 stainless steel on the outside that is a little bit hotter than the very popular SUS uh, 410 steel. I think. You, you come but to he learn. is a little bit of hotter steel, so it, 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 that's why his engraving is really. Oh. Uh, you can't see so. them. <laughs> you, you definitely come to learn uh, sometimes when you work at Knifeware. You're like, oh, great. A bunch of these. Easy. I can, I can, I can thin out five more tacos, no problem. And then you get, you get a different knife, and you're like, oh god, I do not want to thin. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't want to spend the next eight hours thinning these three knives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we happily do them, yeah, anyways. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's just a part of the job. Uh, Mas uh, Powell, Masashi, uh, found a Masashi uh, Shirogami knife, mm -hmm. um, but it says it looks like kind of like the Kaijin line. Is that that a prototype? Is it? Uh, oh, we used to have that the uh, the the Shiji with the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we used to get some. Yeah, we used to get sure, yeah. yeah. Is he making those anymore or? Uh... He kind of you know, he's able to. <laughs> yeah. I kind of he moved on, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He really likes working with SLD. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Isakarius said, "Will both of you be in Toronto when it opened? Are you going to go to Toronto or when it opens?" We'll probably be there, like you know, in some point. Mm -hmm. Not sure, like when it's open. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably send out different people. Like Kasumi, yeah. for our calorie manager, is going out there permanently to mm -hmm. open it. Yeah. And some staff, uh, some staff might be relocating permanently. Some staff might just go out temporarily yeah. to help out. Mike will be out there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be on leave, so this is my last live stream for a few months. Right. Uh, when you work at Knifer for 10 years, you get three months off paid. He, he's the actual he first one who's actually yeah. doing it. I'm the fourth person to hit it, but everybody else wants to like go travel the world and stuff. And no, I it's, just it's, it's, great. it's great he does that because it, it leaves the precedent. Right? <laughs> Now, be, now, you, now you have to do it. I know, now, exactly. Because huh? <laughs> like, there are a lot more people in line yeah. <laughs> in the back. They're like, oh, at least hidden then. You know? Yeah, a lot yeah. of people are getting close. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm the first one to go. So I'm going to be off uh, in two weeks Yeah. Um, for three months. So I'm going to miss the Toronto opening. And I'm actually pretty bummed out about that. Opening a store is really fun. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also really excited to spend three months with my family. So I think I'll be fine. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I won't be out there. Um, but uh, I'm sure other people cool people will be it'll be yeah absolutely visit. absolutely I, I would love to actually go visit the Toronto store because i'm yeah i mean well you're the sharpening guru so and i'm again, sure you'll it's, go it's, out there it's soon. really easy you know it's traveling to toronto like from calgary is pretty easy like it's only like four yeah trip and yeah yeah uh trevor pinnicky was just saying a signature collaboration with an up-and-coming maker would be incredible uh, uh yeah we be, we're, we're a big fan of supporting the guys that are kind of like working on stuff um uh, do we have anything in the works right now, or not necessarily right now? The uh, I would like to just need more, I guess. Like, say I don't know if you have like a whole bunch. Miyazaki is a uh, Ko Hakata is the uh, kind of our collaboration. We basically wanted to make the. Uh, I basically asked them because he is trained to make that shape. It's called Hakata knife under the uh, under this knife maker in Fukuoka, then um, he's really good at making that shape. Nakiri, his Nakiri was like, okay, you know, like a little bit skinnier. Yeah. But I'm like, you know, Miyazaki-san, you're really good at making, you know, Hakata shape. Why don't you make large Hakata, medium Hakata, and small Hakata? Right. So we have the uh, 210 Hakata, uh, 180 Hakata, right. and 135 Hakata, Ko Hakata. So right. like, we have, I, I, that, that's one of the, one of the kind of collaboration. It's like one of the older, yeah. but we figure he's so good at making that cool shape. Totally. Why don't you like you know make just that shape? Totally. Um, yeah, we. I don't know if it's going to come to us, but the uh, because last trip that I took, I was able to meet those Manaka-san in the uh, Kaskade, mm. and what he was saying is that the uh, he. He loves forging knives. He he doesn't you know he really enjoys what he does, except the uh, he hates sharpening. <laughs> so I was like, alrighty, you know what? I will talk to someone. <laughs> and uh, when I actually went to visit the um, Miljin San, I learned the Miljin San sharpens for a lot of blacksmiths, a lot of knife makers. So I was like, you know, kind of casually chatting mm. and mentioned that yeah you know what you know there's a like young guy in our generation you know same age group 
and then the Cascabe. Right on. That, you know, like, makes great plays, but because it's everything, he does it all by himself, you know, he, so it was like, yeah, so it, there may be. Maybe, maybe it, it, it's work. cool when we, when we get to make those connections, yeah, like yeah. That and yeah, introduce people maybe. because I mean, often you know, historically, it's been not a sometimes secretive industry, but just like people don't always talk to each other, and yeah, so exactly. Help, being able to encourage that open communication between makers has been pretty cool, absolutely, to see. absolutely. That, that's really the uh, that's great because a lot of be, we could do that because we're not the knife makers, we don't make knives, yeah, yeah, we just want everybody to make good knives yeah, we're not, yeah. you know we, our hidden agenda is we want more cool knives yeah <laughs> nothing nefarious uh Pavel L said i saw your masakage yuki knife collection on facebook that uh that i posted uh mm. yesterday i think considering buying a gyuto to mm -hmm. pair with the koishi mm -hmm. which i already have how big are the differences between the koishi and the yuki again, not huge <laughs> again it's the um Wear resistance, basically what that means is that the, how long it's going to take to, well, grind and stuff. The Agami Super definitely has the advantage, like it will keep it such longer. As well, as the um, Agami Super rusts less, it, or rusts slower. So it creates really beautiful patina along the edge. Um, if you do take care of Yuki, it does the same, but it rusts a little bit easier than a Koishi. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. But both are great knives. The uh, made by, um, you know, forged by the same blacksmith, you know, Kato-san, such talented blacksmith. With, with his only, like, the experience, like, he makes such incredible knives. And it's, he was, wasn't producing as much as many, but it seems like the production's kind of back up, and yeah. the quality is kind of as it followed as well. Like it's actually pre making really good numbers and good quality, so it should be. Yeah, they're not good. they're not sacrificing one no. for the other. Uh, JP was asking the eternal question: When will you have Fujiwara Denkas back in stock? That's it's a really hard question yeah. to answer. We have this many older, and we get, you know, yeah, yeah. this many. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, by him, the Kevin visiting him, we get a little bit more <laughs> soon. Hopefully. Yep. It's kind of like trying to find constellations in the night sky, but you live in a big city. Yeah. You're kind of just like, oh, there's one. Yeah. And then like an hour later, you're like, oh, there's another one. <laughs> no, no, it's definitely true. And uh, Kevin says in the what you call at the uh, spring hammer number one, you you know make a older, you put it in a bottle, and just put that in the ocean. Yeah. And hoping someone will you, you find it. You put a it. lot of notes in a lot of bottles in the uh, in, in the ocean. Yeah, and yeah. Hopefully, some of them wash up on the shores of Japan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John Sarge was asking. I've noticed you don't use a lot of Nagura stones, mm -hmm. or do you? Do you want to talk a little bit about those? The Nagura stones are a great tool for getting the slurry out. I don't have to use Nagura stones necessarily for these um, stones that we are using. Nagura stones. What, what it does is that the, uh, say, I don't know what I have here. Let's see. Should I sharpen this? Yeah, I should just. Nagura stone. Well, the this one, if I use Nagura, that will bring up the, uh, bring out the um, slurry as well as the, uh, it opens up the, the pores. Well, porous ish it it cleans off all the clogs right um often i find i don't have to use them because they don't uh, they are not as hard of the steel it you know creates the slurry pretty fast as well if i need to use the gura um, for some stones I do use them, it's just really to strip the um, surface of the, it, it kind of clogs it up, right? So it strips off that the little clogging or peels the one surface out, something like this too. Like if I find this doesn't do, it's not doing as good of the job, I will just use the either Nagura or the uh, this stone to peel that like one thin layer 
off so that it start working again. Um, natural stones is a little bit different story. The, um, I don't necessarily use natural stones as much for uh, my kitchen knife sharpening. I will use them a little bit more for uh, aesthetic um, to make a really nice foggy finish as well as the some um, the tools that I like the what you call it kamisori which is the uh, mm. um, straight razors as well as some of the uh, tools that's for uh, wood carving tools like um, chisels um, planes the the reason why I use the natural stones for that is the uh, Natural stone works fantastic for the blades that works on a push cut, basically like like this way. Mm. So you don't yeah. like like a razor. You like a razor. Yeah, yes. yeah. Cool. Uh, Shane Shane's suggestion was: uh, Are you sharpening Kevin's? No, uh, I just like touch Kevin's, it up. Oh, okay. I, I don't want to touch those <laughs> yeah, the, the Kevin Kent it. special Takeda. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure it's dry. Uh, that's the, <laughs> the Takeda Santoku made by Kevin Kidd. Yeah. Um, Shane's suggestion was just laser engraved knife, the Knifer logo on some knives. And you know what? We actually did that. Yeah, uh, that, that was that knife. Yeah, and <laughs> our staff were huge fans of it. A lot of staff own these knives. Um, they were super thin. They are made from Swedish steel. They're pretty rad. Um, they didn't sell very well at all. <laughs> Nobody wanted them. It was, it was probably be before the... Uh, you know, we were that big. Either. Yeah. Well, and our logo was a lot less cool back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. That was that was our old logo, which was fine. Yeah. But our, our new logo is much much cooler. So yeah, maybe we'll try that again. Yeah. Um. Uh, Philip Borneman just loves the Miyazaki Hakata. Mm -hmm. Spoon Monkey says tank versus cleaver. So, tank is different than mm. a cleaver. The um, whole idea of tank that whole idea and how it's done is quite a bit different. The, it really depends on how you look at it, but the, if you look at a regular tank, tank is the knife that's produced, I guess, by the Takayuki Shibata-san, who is the president of the um, Masakage, as well as the, he's the, the sharpener behind the Kotetsu knives. Super thin, really nice and clean. Idea of tank, tinker tank, <coughs> is that the he wanted to create this like really rough kind of out image, but also he challenged those blacksmiths like um, Takumi Ikeda-san to forge in a way that's quite out of ordinary from what they usually do. What that means is that the uh, spine of the knife is really actually thick. It's about four millimeters thick at the uh, handle, but he forges into nice thin three like taper is it really good, mm. and also it has the taper forged taper in this way as well. Mm. Usually in takefu or that that part of Japan or the knife making, they make a little bit of taper here, but they don't usually make much taper down here. Although they do make the edge thickness the same, there aren't that much of the three-dimensional forging, mm -hmm. which um, basically he, well, the um, Shibata-san asked and challenged the uh, Ikeda-san saying, hey, I got a really, really cool idea. Can you actually do this? And then he, he can do it because the shibata sans the one who is going to get the blank blade and sharpen them, mm -hmm. right? So it is quite a bit different function. The uh, you will not you're not really doing the tank. You're not using a tank for you know cleaving kind of purposes. It is still thicker, but it's really nicely sharpened mm -hmm. um, everyday type of kitchen knife. It is pretty tall. I've seen a lot of people trying to you know. Make the knife that looks like it, but if you actually look closely and how it's forged and everything, tank is like some sort of um, no one 
Yeah, well, you can't you can't just look at a picture of it. And, exactly. And, and, exactly. Knock, and knock it off. No, like, no, it's because uh, it's it's all like it's all in that the yeah, three dimensional you have to thing. Handle one and yeah. have a good eye and also a lot of blacksmiths. Exactly. And sharpening. Skill. Exactly. Yeah. They can make they can a lot of blacksmiths can make the blade look like tank, but it, they're not tank. Hmm. There is only one tinker tank. Yeah. Um, Trevor Pinnicky says, I try to support young makers. I like watching them grow. Nice guys. Yeah, so we, we do too. We did a video, uh, you know, I'm just going to keep plugging videos that we've made, but we did a video a month ago or so about kind of our top five up and coming, mm. uh, not just blacksmiths, knife makers. Mm. In 2022, we talked about Masashi Yamamoto-san. We talked about um, uh, Ikeda-san, right? Yeah. Um, you know, guys that are a little more established but are still kind of on the rise. Yeah. As well as people that are, you know, quite new, like Tetsujin Hamono and Isamitsu. Isamitsu, yeah. it's pretty new. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we really do too. Uh, we've got, you know, we have our garage sale where we bring in stuff with, you know, from, from younger guys that maybe don't make enough knives for us to carry full time. Yeah, we, we have um, Shindo Kyohei. Kyohei Shindo-san from Tosa. We have... Um, uh, Yukihiro Sakai-san from the mm -hmm. Kumamoto. Yeah, he's really, he's like my age. Like he's really young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinker, yeah. 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 Um, and our Small Makers Month in kind of July, August, too, We uh, is the time we like to highlight those guys. Yeah. So stay tuned. We've also got uh, a young guy making knives for us. Uh, super, super limited production because he's still in high school. Mm. Uh, he'll be graduating, I guess, next month. Wow. Uh, Kenzie Aaron. Uh, we also did a video profile on him last year. Um, but he's from Claire's Home, Alberta, and he's... No, the, uh, the... Sorry, not Claire's the, Home. I no, say Claire's Home. The Cameros. Cameros, thank yeah. you, yeah. Um, so many small towns in Alberta. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's from Cameros, and he is making Japanese-inspired knives mm. in Alberta, and uh, and there's some pretty incredible stuff. We're, we're hoping to get some more knives from him in maybe July, August, yeah. um, once, once he's graduated high school yeah. and has more free time. Um... <clears throat> Trevor Benicky, I just love this. Went with a cleaver, mostly because if I'm doing Chinese cooking, I use a cleaver shape. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I never do. Mm -hmm. I would say that's crazy, Trevor, but I do the exact same mm -hmm. thing. I have I have a Chinese cleaver that I use when I cook Chinese food, which is relatively often. Uh, and then I don't really use it outside of that. But that's, you know, it's great for that. Oh, Grant said the top five knife makers video is very helpful. I'm glad to hear it. That the uh, that, that that point, the uh, using a Chinese cleaver for Chinese cooking? Yeah. Oh, my God. That, I... I have to get the Chinese cleaver now. <laughs> so I said I'll I use come a Chinese think of cleaver. It. I use a Megan Nakiri. Ah. Because I, I, I like Chinese cleavers, but they're just, they're so big. Uh, yeah. 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 I don't know. 240 Yuto, great size. Yeah. Chinese cleaver, for some reason, is too big. <laughs> um, Toby Willows says, what are your thoughts on Ishikawa? Uh, Ishikawa-san is the, um, uh, the guy I was actually going to... So... Oh, okay. Well, not, not this guy, but okay. the... Uh, not this guy, but... So Ishikawa-san is the uh, the guy in the the Tohoku area. I, can't, I have to double check on the exact location. But in that region, they make the uh, knife like this. This is very typical knives from that region. Ishikawa-san, yeah, makes it like this. Cool. Um, it's like you know, but it's got a rip. It's got yeah, so we carry the, the yeah. So we carry the knife from different knife maker in uh, some. Kind of a similar area in Tohoku. The uh, this is Suzuki San. So it's uh, beveled this way and flat on the other side. It's pretty good. It's very unique. Uh, it cuts very different. Uh, we've been actually working with the Suzuki San and to create this uh, shape called well shape Gyoto shape. He only made the Nakiri, which is like this, uh, and a Santoku, and he had a smaller cone Santoku and cone Nakiri. Ishikawa-san's knife's great. It's, it cuts really good. We don't carry them. It's just because we have the uh, other knife maker, Suzuki-san, makes it the mm. same same kind of. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why they make this way, and so is the Ishikawa-san. They are the old like sickle maker, so they they try to use the similar technique to making sickles. Yeah, it makes for a really unusual knife, but really really cool. And just it's nice. It's refreshing to see something so different. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to use that to transition? I don't think we'll, we're almost out of time, so we won't do any sharpening on this guy, but this is our, this is our expert level Guto sharpening. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, 
as you can see, the um, just gonna put it right here. Is it in the camera? No. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So here, this is how he sharpens the edge, the bevel. Pretty consistent, the same same thickness all the way, right? Very typical. Um, hmm? Oh, yeah. uh, just gonna help oh, there. That focus okay. a bit. There we go. Good. Yep. All right. See, like it's it's all pretty even right here. Spine of which is pretty thick, doesn't taper as much. So, we asked the uh, Suzuki-san to make a prototype uh, Gyuto, and we got this. But, I just tapped the microphone, so I'm gonna make sure that's still on. Okay, so, when he sh sent it, he made a knife like this, and a bevel like this, and it was, it was, I did a modification. It was like this all the way. But. But not anymore. Not anymore. It fan out. I made this modification because it really wanted to highlight and showcase that torsion 3D or 4D sharpening on this one. And I thought this is fantastic because you can make a so exaggerated version. So this one here, it's got a bevel here, and bevel goes up like this way. It's very thin, and, and I don't overexpose the course to you either. And it's thin here, and it's quite a bit of, so what this does is almost a ultimate knife that the food won't stick. So I will show you how it cuts. You want to compare? Yeah, one second. I'm just, I'm just gross it out. Ah, ah, ah. It's so gross. Yes, yes. Here. So I have cutting board right here. Okay, good. You know, you know, we gotta stick it down. Oh, sure. Like this? Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, yeah. great. I'm bump the exposure down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Quit showing your carrot. <laughs> it's time to drink beer. <laughs> beer. Three. Two change brewing. In Alberta. Thank you. I can drink all four of these, right? Uh, no, it's that one. What are you guys doing? Sharpening. Well, we were. Sorry, it's not on anymore? It's on. No, Still. We, I said we're not sharpening anymore. Now, now we're showing off our carrots. What are you doing? Kevin Kent is here, everybody, in the house. He's not real quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was adjusting the uh, exposure there, and then I got distracted by beer. Oh. Oh. Hey. So, here. Is everyone still here? All right. <laughs> I don't know if it's the top down or that camera there, but uh, it's top down now. Okay, top down here. Okay, here's a carrot. Carrot is great uh, testing, I guess, vegetables when you are testing how thin your knives are, right? So I'm just gonna try first one here. Well, it is. I know it's thin, so let's try the uh, this guy here, the koishi that I just thin a little bit. I'm just gonna cut the top off. Oh, we can off. see your head. Uh, <laughs> So when I'm testing, I just cut it this way. Listen to what kind of sound it makes. It still cuts smooth, and if you see the, uh, the yeah, it's nice and smooth. If you cut with a little bit thicker knife, it will break them, right? And you'll hear it make like kind of a creaking noise. Yeah, yeah. I did kind of hear its creaking noise, but here, the. Uh, I made the edge that's, again, cross edge, so I can do it very lightly on the push cut or the uh, pull cut. It, it got, and you can hear it's actually a little bit toothier. I don't know. I can hear him. It's toothier. I, I can hear from here. I don't know. I need to stick the microphone next to it. But. All right. Yeah. Should I? Yeah, we got okay. Let's give people the full experience, like you're right here in the studio with us. I don't 
because here it was a little bit more toothier. It's got the, it's not super, super smooth, but it definitely has good teeth to it. Mm -hmm. And this teeth is great when you're actually making, say, salsa and stuff because it cuts like this way really good. Anyways, so that's that yeah, kind of two-way edge. Yeah, if you want to dice up like 10 tomatoes yeah. uh, and not hate the process, that's the kind of edge you want. But what I want to show you is this. So when you're cutting with the uh, this, this two, I guess, equal bevel knife, right? Good. Try to cut the... Okay, try, I'm going to try to cut the um, like two millimeter thick. Right? This is how it cuts. You see them there? Okay. Yeah. The, the here. Okay? Same thickness. Good. You see here? Ah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's splitting right off. It's completely different. Ah, it's a little bit thicker. So if I do it a little thin, see? 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 It, yep. The carrot just falls. Oh, man peels right off right so this is type of edge that I if for those people who doesn't want the knife to be like you know knife to the food to stick on the blade see 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 here see so just peels right off um, interesting edge it's not going to be, this is a, one of the custom type of, um, you know, sharpening that I did. So it's not available. <laughs> but the, um, I really like this because how he makes it, right? The, uh, the way he make, it, it still does stick it when, when you, you know, try to make a julienne. But the, um, but, you know, it's, it's incredible how this how it cuts like this how it just pops and drops sorry for the people left-handed <laughs> uh, it is very light right-handed knife right now <laughs> you're right in theory you could do it the other way and get all in theory if it's the uh yeah if yeah. it's forged with the uh, yeah so you can make it super thin wow right yeah I don't know if the overhead camera captures it pretty good, but oh yeah, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, it looks great. It's pretty wild. I hope everybody else's mind is as blown as mine is. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's still nice and smooth, but the yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Naoto. That was really cool. Um, I else? thought it's really cool. <laughs> I, I think so too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope I hope everybody learned something today. Um, we uh, we're running out of time. So we still got to break down all our gear, uh, and Kevin is uh, pressuring us to drink beer. So uh, I think we have to do that. But uh, I, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for tuning yeah. in. Uh, you won't be hearing my voice for a few months because I'm going on leave. Um, but uh, Sky and Naoto and maybe even Mason will be still doing the live streams. We've got um, <clears throat> the next live streams we do will be for the garage sale. Uh, which right. is coming up. This, the sale runs May 15th to the 22nd. So I'll have an unboxing live stream where we get the whole sale set up on the 12th uh, in the afternoon. And then we'll have a big marathon on the Monday to kick off, kick off the sale. And then a shorter one to wrap things up later on. Uh, and then in June or July, I'm sure they'll do uh, a couple of live streams while I'm away. So yeah. stay tuned I don't know. for those. We may do a live stream from Toronto? Oh, hopefully. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, maybe something about Conroe's in the summer, in June. Yeah. A little bit of barbecue type stuff. Oh, it's, it, now it's just going to town. Then. No, it just <laughs> bites. It, it, it's fun. You need to get you a big, it's, it's got you, uh, it's, the extra large cutting it, board. <laughs> it's fun to use sharp knives, right? It is. Well, yeah, it's funny. Like, you know, we work with knives so much. We've been working with knives for over 10 years, but you still get excited when you have like a, an edge that good. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. All right, thank you. Have a fantastic <laughs> weekend. Have and, a good weekend. And, uh, yeah, we will see you next time. Yeah. Whatever that is. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.